Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. Today is our monthly Q&A, so apologies in advance to all of those whose names I will butcher today. If I say your name wrong, please let me know the correct pronunciation in the comments. I will try my best to get it right. But first, let's warm up with Dao De Jing commentary and Xiu Dao. This week's topic is a famous sentence from the second chapter of Dao De Jing. It is Yo Wu Xiang Sheng. In the first chapter, Lao Zi introduced the Dao. Then he continued introducing his philosophical relativism and his explanation of the universe, which is Yo Wu Xiang Sheng. To understand it, let me introduce the context of his sentence first. In the second chapter of Dao De Jing, he said, quote, Tian Xia Jie Zhi Wei Zhi Wei Mei Si E Yi Jie Zhi Shan Zhi Wei Shan Si Bu Shan Yi Translation, The whole world knows the beautiful as beautiful only because of the existence of the ugly. The whole world knows the good as good only because of the existence of the bad. End translation. Then he continued, quote, Gu you wu xiang sheng, nan yi xiang sheng, chang duan xiang xing, gao xia xiang qing, yin sheng xiang he, qian hou xiang sui. End quote. Translation. Hence, the being and the non-being coexist. The difficult and the easy complement each other. The long and the short manifest themselves by comparison. The high and the low complement as well as oppose each other. The con consonants and the vowels harmonize with each other. The front and the back follow each other. End translation. So here, the famous concept, Yo Wu Xiang Sheng, or the being and the non-being coexist. To have a better understanding, let me translate the sentence Yo Wu Xiang Sheng word by word. Yo means existence. Wu means non-existence. Xiang means mutually. Sheng means generate or transmit. Together, this sentence means two opposite entities not only coexist but also interdependent. It is the philosophical foundation of yin and yang. In other words, the yin and the yang relationship reflects the concept of coexistence of two opposite entities. Oh, Yo Wu Xiang Sheng. So, how should you apply Yo Wu Xiang Sheng in Xiu Dao practice? Let me explain. Yo or existence and Wu or non existence actually mean dynamic and static in Xiu Dao. As Huang Yuanji said, quote, Yu Yo Wu Xiang Sheng Bu Guo Dong Er Jing. 静而动, 出玄入聘, 我理, 阴阳也, end quote. Translation, it is called existence and non-existence coexist together. Actually, it is just the dynamic and the static natures circulating in the universe and adjusting yin and the yang energy. End translation. In Xiu Dao practice, it is the process of preparing the body for practice. For example, when maintaining a static state, a practitioner must forget to write thoughts. In the meditative state, energy and the spirit will merge together as one. Then, all of a sudden, energy rises in that state. At this moment, the practitioner should still maintain the same state without adding any actual action, and gradually, spirit and energy will enter another state. So, the 
non-thought state or the static state is the non-existence, while the energy rising experience is the existence. As uh, described, the energy rising and stabilizing processes or experiences are the static and the dynamic or non-existence and the existence, which should be managed through the Wu Wei approach or non-action approach in Xiu Dao. It is worth noting that the changing of the static and the dynamic occurs through the emergency of the Xuan Guan or Ministry Gate, a concept that I have introduced in a prior video. Link is in the description. So, Xuan Guan is the energy pathway between the static and the dynamic in Xiu Dao practice. It is a deep topic, and I have introduced its core concept here. In summary, Yo Wu Xiangsheng or existence and non existence coexist, which can be used as a guiding principle for Xiu Dao practice. Now, Let's get on what today's Q&A. Questions answered in today's video include First, Gan Wei Ming, Dao De Jing and Yi Jing. Next, Dark Wenduk, Xing Yi vs. Xin Yi Liu He. Third, Thomas Hudsack, Tai Chi Learning Process. Next, Bruno Waste and Hip Separation in Xing Yi. Next, H. Christian, Xiu Dao and Nei Dan. Next, uh, Vidir, Strength Training with Martial Art Practice. Next, Gym Stretch, Bagua Walking Purpose. Guan Wei Ming asked a question about Dao De Jing and Yi Jing. It's a culture related question. He says, quote, What is the difference between Yi Jing 6 4 and Dao De Jing 9 time 9 equals 81. In what situation to apply? This is a very interesting question since he used the word to apply. I'd like to answer it briefly. First of all, Dao De Jing and Yi Jing are two different types of books. Dao De Jing, the book of Dao, is a philosophy book, while Yi Jing, the Book of Changes is more about the practice of uh, divination. Yes, people can summarize some uh, philosophical concepts and principles based on Yi Jing, for example, naive dialecticism or Pu Su Bian Zhong Fa, as they can with uh, many other similar books. But Yi Jing's application cannot change the nature of that book. So, it is up to the reader to apply them in life. The books by themselves are not meant to provide a fixed and specific instruction like a user manual. Another interesting culture related information about the number used in each book. Since you pointed out that Yi Jing is 6 4, which is 8 times 8. Well, the Dao De Jing is 81, which is 9 times 9. In Chinese culture, an even number stands for the Yin energy, and an odd number stands for the Yang energy. However, Yin and Yang can convert to each other under certain conditions. So, Dao De Jing emphasizes the concept of a Yin. Which was expressed by Lao Zi using double Yang or two nights, which will render the Yin energy. In other words, Dao De Jing's number is 81 because the book has 81 chapters, but actually it is the double Yang energy, which will transform to Yin. As for Yi Jing, the number of this book is 6 4 and 2 8 which will transform to Yin energy. In other words, Yi Jing's number is 64 since it has the 64 hexagrams, but 
Actually, it is the double yin energy, which will transform to yang. Yi Jing emphasizes the concept of yang energy. Again, it is a culture related topic. Of course, the number 64 and 81 are, in my opinion, just a coincidence. But the coincidence can still give us some hints about these two books. Wei Ming, I hope I have answered your question. Thank you for asking. Let's move on to the next one. Dark Wen Duke asked a question about the body differences between Xing Yi and Xin Yi Liu He. This is a great question. In my prior videos, I have briefly mentioned this topic. Today, I'd like to elaborate more. First of all, some people believe that they are the same style but with different body structure. The claim is that Xin Yi Liu He or the heart mind says harmony style uses a big structure, while Xing Yi or the body and the mind style uses a more compact body structure. They believe this also because both styles have many of the same documents as their guiding principle. Well, I disagree, mainly because, first, body structure is the key determinator in differentiating a style from other. Xing Yi's body structure is based on the Santi stance of the three body stance, a back weighted stance, while Xin Yi Liu He is the opposite, a front weighted stance. Second, power generation method. Xing Yi focuses on the forward and the backward power release, while Xin Yi Liu He mainly focuses on the upward and the downward power release. Both of these power releasing methods are determined by their power generation method. As a result, Xing Yi applies a softer approach, while Xin Yi Liu He applies a relatively harder approach. Plus, their practice content routines are different. Xing Yi was developed based on the Dai family Xin Yi, which in turn was developed based on Xin Yi Liu He. In other words, Dai family Xin Yi already made a lot of changes compared to the original Xin Yi Liu He. Li Luoneng, the Xing Yi founder, who learned the Dai family Xin Yi, made even more changes in body structure, power generation method, routines, and so on. So, a few old Xing Yi documents, for example, Jiu Yao Lun are actually for Xin Yi Liu He and Xin Yi. Later generations of Xing Yi practitioners wrote many documents for Xing Yi. Also, most of the old Xin Yi Liu He documents cannot be applied directly to Xing Yi. So, the claim of Xing Yi and Xin Yi Liu He being the same style based on some commonly used document is just planned wrong. I have introduced in some prior videos that the San Ti based stance can greatly improve the body flexibility in power release. Also, the San Ti based stance makes Xing Yi more internal. Based on my research, Xing Yi, the style developed by Li Luoneng based on Dai family Xin Yi, actually makes Xing Yi more suitable for civilian life in general, since Xin Yi Liu He's structure is just a weapon structure. It seems as if a person is moving with a weapon in hand, but Xing Yi is different. The bare hand movements are developed without maintaining an obvious weapon imagery. So, Xing Yi was created for bare hands, a well-developed system for bare hand practice. Xin Yi Liu He's bare hand practice is still more militaristic in nature compared to that of Xing Yi. There have been many good Xin Yi Liu He practitioners in history. 
Also, many good Xin Yiliu Hua teachers still teach in China. For example, recently I watched a video of Yang Haiming, a great practitioner and teacher of Xin Yiliu Hua style. So, I like both Xin Yiliu Hua and Xing Yi, even though I do not practice Xin Yiliu Hua. Dr. Wenduk, I hope I have answered your question. Let's move on to the next one. Ms. Thomas Hudesak asked a question about Tai Chi training method. He says, quote, I often heard that in the old times, the Tai Chi practitioners only learned the meanings of the movements and the martial applications after mastering the form. Is that true? Isn't it much more logic to first understand the application and then to incorporate them that into the Tai Chi practice of the single movements? End quote. This is a good question since it touches the teaching methodology issue. Short answer, it depends. Let me explain. We have to know that the most people practice Tai Chi for health and uh, nothing more. Even in old days, a majority of Tai Chi practitioners were the same. At the best, they practiced mainly for health, if not ex exclusively. So, understanding the application of the form actually does not make much difference without practicing it correctly in both form and application. Application training requires a training partner, or else this would not be much benefit only knowing the application. Application is mastered through practice, not by merely knowing. At the same time, understanding the application really helps in understanding the movement, especially when people practice Tai Chi for self-defense. Speaking from teaching experience, explaining the martial application aspect of a movement during formal practice is an effective way no matter whether people practice Tai Chi for health or for self-defense. Internal martial art practice emphasizes on the mind, and this aspect is practiced through knowing the objective of a movement. Otherwise, it would just be a movement without sufficient mental work, getting reduced from a martial practice to a relaxation practice. So, introducing the martial application and then incorporating that into the formal practice is a quick way to master Tai Chi. Now, let's talk about the unfortunate fact. Many Tai Chi teachers themselves do not know its applications, and sometimes they may know about it but cannot demonstrate it. So, it is hard to ask for it if the teacher doesn't know about it to begin with. To summarize, the old days of Tai Chi practice were not necessarily better days. Actually, many modern Tai Chi teachings are much more effective and efficient in terms of teaching. Also, it depends on the student's attitude towards practice too. Mr. Huda said, I hope I have answered your question. Thank you for your asking. Let's move on to the next one. Bruno asked a question about hip movement after watching the video on Bagua separation of a waist and a hip. He says, quote, I would like to ask you a question about waist and hip separation in Xing Yi. When you send the power out in Pi Quan, do you move hip first and then move the waist but hand and foot, elbow and knee arrived together? Bruno's question is a detailed one. Yes, it is a good question since he is asking about the Pichuan, the metal fist, not a general principle since different movements should apply different principles. So, for Pichuan, yes, the hip should arrive at the right plate first, then the other body parts move in the power generation process. 
The other part is hip first, then the waist, then foot, and eventually hand. There are very subtle differences between movements in terms of time sequence. As for the elbow and the knee, it is incorrect to physically arrive together, but should arrive together energy-wise. Bruno, I hope I have answered your question. Thank you for such a detailed question. Let's move on to the next one. H. Crestad asked a shootout question. In my video titled Supreme Medicine in Shootout number 3, I said, Primordial Jing, Qi, and Shen will only be consumed without practice, but Postmodal Jing, Qi, and Shen can be improved by the intake of nutrients, different exercises, and other means. Then he asked, quote, Do you mean that Primordial Jing, Qi, and Shen will be consumed faster if one does not take care of eat healthy exercise and cultivate in order to replace Jing, Qi, and Shen. I understand that we are replaced or filled up with the postmodal Jing, Qi, and Shen, but isn't it the whole point of Nei Dan to reverse the process and become able to replace primordial Jing, Qi, and Shen also? Good question indeed. Actually, it is a very commonly neglected topic in Xiu Dao practice, even though it is the fundamental Taoist elixir practice concept. Let me elaborate on it. Taoist internal elixir practice is a reward flow of energy practice, which means that the post mordial energy should be transformed to primordial energy through specific practice, the Xiu Dao practice. This is the fundamental Taoist concept that guides any internal elixir related practice. In other words, any energy gained through nutrients, physical exercises, and other means is the process to improve the post mortal energy to support our daily activity. Post mortal energy cannot automatically be transformed to the primordial energy without the internal elixir practice, according to Taoism. So, replacement of Jing, Qi, and Shen is the post mortal process in our daily life which needs to be transformed to the primordial ones through the reverse flow practice. And according to the Taoist standard, it is not that the post-mortal energy will easily be transformed to the primordial energy, since it requires some prerequisites such as Xuan Guan or Mystery Gate and many other energy experiences that indicate that the body is ready for it. It is not a mechanical process, but an energetic process. Chris Tart, I hope I have answered your question. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify it. Let's move on to the next question. Vader asked a question on the Dao Yi Discord. He says, I'm wondering what's the best way to combine strength training, uh, for example, going to the gym with a sensitivity training. I practiced each one and I found when I go to the gym, my muscle sensitivity is reduced. In one of the video, Hai Yang mentions that sensitivity is just one technique aspect. You also need uh, strength to combine with it. But what is the best approach to train both such that one will not interfere with other in a negative way? It is a good question. In some prior videos, especially the Q&A videos, I have answered this type of question by saying that muscle is necessary in martial art practice and it will not have any negative impact on practice if you manage it well. So, the new question is how to allocate your training efforts 
between martial art training and the muscle training in a gym. Actually, if I understand your situation well, the reason should be that you did not practice martial art movement such as Yi Quan at full speed with power. Any martial art practice, if you do not apply speed and power but only practice the form in a relaxed and slow movement fashion, then it would be very hard to build the necessary muscle and strength. Then muscles built through some weight lifting exercises at the gym may make the muscle movement slow. The reason is that different type of muscle have different functions and in martial art practice, we need muscles for both strength and speed. So, my suggestion is that you should practice each one with speed and power as part of your training each time. Traditionally, we practice martial art weapons, especially spears. Based on my training experience, spear training is the best way to build muscle and speed used for martial arts. I hope I have answered your question. Let's move on to the final question for today. Jim Stretch made a comment on my video titled Bagua Stepping Demystifying Mud Wedding Walking Method. In that video, I introduced the history, practice, and the principle of mud wedding walking of Cheng Style Bagua. However, he says, quote, it's not mud walking, it's the low kick practice. The mainland regime killed all the traditional boxers, so now they are trying to recreate the arts from books and they don't know the applications. End quote. His emotional claim is so interesting and I did not even give any comment. I'd like to take this opportunity to share my understanding of his comment in today's video. Actually, I have debunked this misunderstanding in some prior videos already. Regardless, I'd like to add more information today on this kind of pre-internet error statement. Like I said before, this claim is one of the biggest lies in the Chinese martial art community. Let me explain. Yes, the Cultural Revolution was actually a cultural destruction, to use my own term. During that decade, many elites, especially political and intellectual elites, were killed for social political reasons. Of course, many martial artists were a part of the elite since many of them had neither direct or indirect relationships with politics. But who told you all of the traditional boxers were killed during the decades of Cultural Revolution? Did you see it in person, or can you name a credible source of your information? If all of the traditional martial artists were killed, do you have an exact number of deaths with names? Was your claim based on emotion or rumor or eyewitness? That type of claim just does not make any sense since it does not reflect the truth. Martial art is the technical system and a part of a culture, but it cannot be removed from a society in a mere decade. I'm from mainland China and I have personally witnessed learned from and practiced with many good teachers in the traditional styles. If you have never visited any good martial art teachers in mainland China, then that is your problem. Please do not make this kind of exaggerated claim. Actually, before the Cultural Revolution, which happened around 1966, lasting for about a decade, some good martial artists moved from mainland to Taiwan and Hong Kong in 1949 when the Communist Party came to the power in Beijing. But 
those people who taught internal style of martial arts in Taiwan and Hong Kong actually learned and practiced in the mainland. For example, Zhang Junfeng, Wang Shujin, those Xing Yi and Bagua teachers learned in Tianjin and moved to Taiwan around 1949 due to political reasons. It is not that Taiwan and Hong Kong internal martial artists created their own styles over there but in fact they moved there long after learning those arts. Then many people from the West learned from those teachers since mainland China was under the Mao administration and the country was closed off to the West. Of course, it is so easy for people in the martial art community outside of China to say whatever they want in order to promote their own practice. But after the 1990s, especially after the 2000s, many martial artists from mainland China moved to the West and many Westerners traveled to China to practice martial arts. And all of them can attest to the presence of a traditional practice in mainland China. To use myself as an example, what I'm teaching are the authentic traditional internal styles, and I'm from mainland China. If your claim is true, then where did I learn my practice? By the way, about 20 years ago, a new Xinyi student in my class once asked me, do you have a teacher in Montreal? I was surprised by this kind of question. Then I answered, yes, I have many English teachers in Montreal. <laughs> of course, he realized that I gave a sarcastic but factually answer to an ignorant question. This comment isn't too far off in nature. I digress. Anyway, back to the topic. As for Bagua walking, in the traditional Chinese martial art community, we differentiate between the fundamental practice such as basic walking and some stationary practice and their applications in practice, but unify them in application. <clears throat> For example, Bagua mud riding stepping is the fundamental practice but you can apply it to many situations including kicking, locking, pushing, stepping, unrooting and many many more. So, the claim that Bagua walking is only for kicking purpose is already a false claim and this is the basic knowledge to a traditional martial artist. I hope people will focus on their practice, not on unnecessary political and historical distortions. I hope my feedback to your comment makes sense but anyway, thank you for your comments. That brings us to the end of today's video. Thank you all for your questions and I hope you found my answers informative. As always, please don't hesitate to ask a follow up or enter new questions. Thanks for watching, see you next time and enjoy your practice.